c'est un plaisir pour moi d'être avec vous autres. Et en order to uh, speak directly to, to the group uh, on this issue of territorial conflicts of sovereignty in Europe, I have, uh, in fact, entitled my paper Deliberative Constitutionalism to the Rescue of Complex Democratic Settings. So the current debates about sovereignty should, should not be limited to issues of legality or legitimacy, as is too often uh, times witness on the terrain of politics. Time and again, we've seen political actors intervening on behalf of the majority nation, hiding behind the veil of the legality to undermine or seek to uh, discredit claims made by minority groups and minority nations. So the initiative uh, led by the Ursko Ikats Kunza and the Institut de Studies Catalans comes at the crucial moment as several countries are facing internal tension. And, and we see that uh, in, many, in many places. I mean, the issue has been for the central state to try to centralize power, to try to develop symmetry, try to have higher performance Performance. I mean, these, these are the issues that is often being raised. And both unitary and federal states are, have been frequently implementing similar strategies to respond to forces associated with globalization that they use as a pretext to take away powers that have been assumed at the sub-state level at different moments. So in, in this presentation, uh, in my paper, I will be focusing on four elements. First, the need to revisit the debate concerning the exercise of sovereignty. Second, to highlight different forms of legitimacy uh, and distinguishing third, the, between constitutional authority and constitutional morality. And finally, uh, I am challenging the position that is considered to be acceptable in some circles that might makes right. So I. I adopt instead a position that consists in endorsing a liberal Republican model that feeds on liberal democratic constitutionalism as a way forward to advance just democracy. So with respect to point one, respect to the idea of reformulating the, the terms of the debate about sovereignty, which I see as an imperative. Now we, we know that political actors acting on behalf of and on behalf of the state are quick to declare that all individuals are equal before the law, that the rules of the game have been set once and for all, and that the state is there to guarantee its territorial integrity against all possible external and internal threats. Now, in such a context, there is no palpable intention to adhere to the central principle of constitutionalism, which are encapsulated by the three notion of political, the political consent the cultural continuity and reciprocity. Now, these three notions are quite essential if we want to advance a, a democracy that respects constitutionalism and, and abeyances. So with the ongoing political transformation taking place below and above the state, one ought to question the postulate according to which the state as a monopoly of legitimate public authority within a set of predetermined frontiers be they the result of a war, of a process of decolonization, or among various scenarios of a, a process of territorial enlargement or aggregation. Now, actors discussing territorial integrity are likely to focus on legality and pay only lip service to the notion of legitimacy. The latter, that is, legitimacy, however, remains highly important since it is crucial for state managers to attain the highest level of popular support possible behind state reforms in order to advance the policy preferences that are emanating from the political communities. So here, constitutional and political arrangements are there to be negotiated, not to be imposed, so that the legitimacy principle is at its highest. Now, which form can sovereignty take to meet the needs of citizen and political communities, such an understanding, such an undertaking is particularly crucial in cases of several nations that cohabit on a, on a specific territory. The case of Belgium, obviously, Canada, uh, Spain, the UK are all confronted with this. So we need, therefore, 
and this is my second point, to reconcile between different forms of legitimacy. Inter-community relations would gain to be reimagined on a new basis. In, in my paper, I argue that we ought to replace the dyad of legality, legitimacy by the dyad of legitimacy, legitimacy, nothing less, without which the parties to the conflict will continue to lock themselves into logic that are impossible to reconcile due to the fact that they operate on parallel paths with no possibility of converging. Now, rethinking the, the conflict in terms of legitimacy makes it possible to give a voice to all potential political actors rather than disqualifying actors or taking them, taking them out of the political game for all sorts of reasons. We have to start from the premise that both sides in a political conflict have and can invoke valid arguments to question the fairness and power sharing, the equal capacity of everyone to accomplish oneself and fully exercise one's civil, political, social, and cultural rights. And third, the validity and importance of their counterpart political legitimacy. The argument heard too frequently that there is no legitimacy beyond legality is not an acceptable one, since it closes all democratic channels and constitutes an imposition of political strength on weaker political partners. It is as if a state, whatever the political preferences expressed by the constituent political communities has the right to be intolerant toward cultural, ideological, social and societal differences. Now here federalism has some valuable cues to provide since a federal constitution is one, to quote Stephen Tierney, one which is premised upon territorial constituent power, which prioritizes the constitutional status symbolically and substantially of its constituent territories, end of quote. So the source of political authority in a multinational political setting, and by extension, the strength of its legitimacy is the popular will expressed first and foremost through political institution operating at a sub-state level, as well as through the state itself. It is a combined aspiration of these two forms of representation that will give political actors the legitimacy to put forward political solution and implement public policies. Now, the third point I want to raise is the point about how do we differentiate between constitutional authority and constitutional morality? Some states are of the view that the Constitution is sacred, a sacred document that once adopted can no longer be modified. The spokesperson used various strategies either to undermine or to oppose political changes as being expression of disloyalty toward the all-encompassing state or as deserving the national interest. Such a pursuit has been properly qualified by Paolo Busakama Busquets when discussing the Judgment 42, 2014 of the Spanish Constitutional Court, denying the Catalan Parliament the right to consult the people of Catalonia with respect to its political future as a clear expression of constitutional fundamentalism. That is that according to the latter, there is no legitimacy behind legality, there is no democracy outside the constitution. Now difficult for anyone to imagine that the principle of legitimacy can be reduced to so little. According to the constitutional court uh, rendering, only a formal constitution can serve as a source of legitimacy. Clearly here, constitutional fundamentalism stands in the way of deliberative constitutionalism, operating as a straitjacket from which it is simply impossible to extract oneself, emptying the principle of liberty of its substance. In such a context, what are we to make of the exercise of democracy itself, of the expression of constitutional morality, as well as the informal constitutional principle or set of ongoing abeyances on which a country has been established, on which the, the foundational principle are resting? Examining the Canadian experience through an appraisal of the 1998 reference case with respect to Quebec rights to secede, it becomes clear that the political partners in a democratic political setting needs to abide to a set of criteria to be able to engage in a trustworthy manner and have the possibility of confronting the respective position 
without undue pressure. The Supreme Court of Canada identified four major principles here that are referred to as the federal principle, the democratic principle, the constitutionalism and the rule of law, and finally, the protection of minority rights. Each of, the, each of these principles cannot trump the other. They have an equi primordial value, and they cannot, as I mentioned, they cannot trump one another. They have to be combined and look at and, and, and taken uh, all together at once. So stated differently, constitutional fundamentalism is simply not an acceptable position for a state to adopt in the context of a complex democratic political setting. We need to find room for the maintenance and pursuit of political deliberation, for the expression of protest and resistance, for the possibility to contest decision with peaceful means and democratic means to dissent. Come to mind the possibility of holding election, of organizing referendum to praise public opinion and assess community preferences. Such action can be undertaken either by the state itself or by a substate. What matters is that the population being consulted is provided with all relevant and balanced information to reach an informed decision without undue and proper pressure or intimidation. Fairness and transparency are essential to the success of these democratic processes. Such an understanding underlines the need to develop a normative constitutional theory that would focus not so much on the content of the constitution, but on the moral principle on which it rests. Which takes me to my fourth point. In some democracy, deliberations have been discouraged when not denounced for mounting a position against the state while political leaders and spokespersons from civil society feeding these deliberations have been depicted as renegades, imposters, or rebels that pursued self-centered aspiration, as if deliberation, protest, and contestation could not produce anything positive for a country. In The Power of Identity, Manuel Castells highlights the value of resistance identities. When discussing, for instance, the women movement, and liberal nationalist project with her, with, which have raised up to resist impulsive might used by dominant political forces. In some countries, one could lament the days when political authority rested on the support of all constitutional partners. In, in situations where political authority rests on the support of all constitutional partners, legal authority will find it much easier to gather political support as well as adhesion to the country's overall objectives. What, what we have seen in the case of Spain is that the balance of trust between historical nationalities and the state have become strained over the years. In good part, this is due to a political process that takes existence from the tenets, that, that the tenets of a deliberative democracy and wants to subject minority nation to a culture in which might makes right. In such a context, coercion takes precedent over social harmony and legitimation and remove from the policy process what exactly Abermas has called the unforced force of the better argument. In short, there is much more to democracy than the election of representative and also than, than to the majoritarian principle. So resistance and contestation are essential component of a healthy democracy. What are we to make, and I'm coming to my conclusion, what are we to make of these theoretical normative considerations with respect to territorial conflict of sovereignty? Now, contemporary democracy are in need of new attributes that would, contrib that would contribute to give a voice to the others rather than to seek to silence them. Monism needs to give way to pluralism. In my recent writings, I've formulated the hypothesis that sovereignty ought to be relational rather than monolithic. There is a lesson that we have learned, I think, in the Canadian case first, from the first people of Canada who have taught us through the continue, continued mobilization in favor of a federal system that would be in tune with all communities occupying the vast span of land north of the 49 parallel. It is essential, therefore, to distinguish between the goals that are being pursued in the context of divided society, representative of the majority nation and tend to impose and maintain its sovereignty over all other components 
This leads at times to unfair treatments and use of coercive measures, whereas minority nations want to acquire some control over sovereignty for the benefit of the cultural, economic, institutional, and political emancipation of their respective community. A world now with respect to the right to decide idea that has acquired some prominence in both Catalonia and the Basque country during the last decade. The right to decide comes with its attributes. For instance, it appears not to challenge or undermine the territorial legitimacy of an existing state as long as the latter is keeping constitutional channels open, as long as it allows its constituent unit to consult its population and does not bully its member state. As a byproduct, the right to decide augment, strengthen relationship between the constituent Des Moines and the state itself. In sum, I'm of the view that the code of good practices that we're working on during this conference, this code of good practices in this, in this various political setting need to insist on four, in fact, four, five, six objectives that I will enumerate to, to wrap up. First, it needs to encourage bottom-up rather than top-down policy initiative. Second, it needs to pursue asymmetrical rather than symmetrical political arrangement. Third, it needs to seek a balance between shared rule and self-rule. Fourth, it needs to promote reciprocity rather than uniformity. Fifth, it needs to implement national pluralism rather than state nationalism. And sixth, it needs to advocate relational, <coughs> relational sovereignty rather than a sacrosanct monist sovereignty. To the extent that complex democratic political setting advance these six objectives in concert, one would assume that the democratic principle will be further entrenched and that state will gain both in political stability and legitimate authority. Escamila, gracias.